25 years ago, Forrest Gump won the Oscar for Best Picture. It's a story of a truly simple man who has a very complicated life. Gump is born in Alabama in the 1940s to a good Christian mother, played by Sally Field. And he grows up without a father in a big old house, but still in poverty. Gump seems destined to win the award for least likely to succeed. He's born with a spine the shape of a question mark, and he spends his childhood in braces, his legs in braces, to try and straighten out that spine. But his biggest challenge is his IQ. He has an IQ of about 75. In the old days, they would have called him a simpleton. Now we would call him mentally disabled. The film is the story of his life, up to around the, year of, uh, the age of 30. He's bullied throughout his childhood, and his sole defense is to run, which is made a lot easier once his braces come off. And that running ability is a skill which gets him a college scholarship and helps him survive the Vietnam War. He only has one friend growing up, and that's Jenny, who we saw in the trailer, played by Robin Wright. She comes from an abusive household. She leaves home as soon as she can, embracing every freedom that she can find. The anti-war movement, drugs, disco. And throughout, Forrest dreams of her, deeply in love with the only young woman he has ever really known. Due to his low IQ, Gump spends most of his life misunderstanding what's going on around him. He's good at taking orders and follows the simple Christian values that his mother taught him. But he doesn't understand world events, and yet he keeps getting caught up in them. This man with an IQ of 75 meets four presidents. He earns a Medal of Honor in the war, and he's one of the first people to buy stock in the Apple company, which makes him wildly wealthy. How can someone so unskilled and so unintelligent do so well? There's a kind of Zen-like quality to Forrest Gump. And watching the movie, I was reminded of an old Taoist story that I know of. And here to tell you that story is Laura Lane, our teacher of Taoist Tai Chi. The useless tree. There once was an old and crooked oak tree by the village shrine. Every branch was twisted and gnarled. The tree was large enough to shade several thousand oxen and was a hundred spans around. It towered above the hilltops with its lowest branches 80 feet from the ground. More than 10 of its branches were big enough to be made into boats. There were crowds of people around it a marketplace. One day, a carpenter and his apprentice walked past the tree. The apprentice said to his master, what a useless tree that is. Its trunk and branches are so crooked, so distorted and full of knots. The wood is so beautiful, but it cannot be cut up. No straight plank can be made from it. The tree serves no purpose at all. But the master carpenter replied, The cinnamon tree is edible, so it is cut down. The lacquer tree is profitable, they maim it. Cherry, apple, pear, orange, lemon trees. As soon as the fruit is ripe, the trees are stripped and abused. Their life is bitter because of their usefulness. That is why they do not live out their natural lives but are cut off in their prime. They attract the attentions of the common world. This is so for all things. That tree in the village is useless. A boat made from it would sink. A coffin would soon rot. It's worthless timber and is of no use. That is why it has reached such a ripe old age. Every man knows how useful it is to be useful. No one seems to know how useful it is to be useless. So for this big tree, no use. It is planted in the wasteland, in emptiness. Yet people walk idly around it and gather under its shadow. No axe prepares its end. 
no one will ever cut it down. Useless? If only you could be so useless. Thank you, Laura. The notion that a tree can be, become so useful by being useless is a paradox. Paradoxes are defined by the coexistence of two opposites, which should be far away from each other, but which come together and stay together. There are many paradoxes in life. The more we learn, the more we realize we don't really know very much. The more you give, the more you get. Toronto has at least 60,000 empty condos and apartments, and yet we also have the country's largest homeless population. The United States has the largest number of Nobel Prize winners in medicine, and yet it also has the largest number of people who have died from COVID-19. In the Forrest Gump movie, paradoxes abound. A simple man with no idea of what's going on becomes a celebrity and wealthy, even when he has no idea why. He helps create the 70s jogging craze. He accidentally creates the smiley face logo. And he helps John Lennon write the song Imagine completely by mistake. His friend Jenny spends her life running away from her abusive father and yet each of her lovers is just as abusive. Paradoxes bring opposites together in a way that defies common sense. These two things should not go together. One way of reacting to a paradox is to get angry about it. That's what Gump's superior officer does, Lieutenant Dan. Lieutenant Dan believed it was his destiny to die in the war just like all of the men in his family had died in wars previous. And so he's really upset when Gump rescues him after his legs are blown off in a battle. He feels he's been robbed of his destiny, and now he believes that he's useless. When he meets Gump in New York, he is livid. He shouts at Gump, how could a moron like you get the Medal of Honor? Dan can see the paradox, and it infuriates him. We often reject paradoxes. They don't seem to make any sense, so we choose one side of the paradox over the other. In modern society, we measure success by wealth. Everyone is encouraged to make as much money as possible. So politicians cut our taxes and they give corporations incentives and grants in the hope that there will be more wealth created. But the result has been fewer people own most of the country and more people are getting poorer. The paradox is getting worse. We often do this. We choose one side of the paradox in hope of escaping it, but in the end, it does just get worse. And that's a hard thing to think about. Paradoxes are puzzling. They're, and that's why paradoxes are often related in stories. And here's one that you can find in the collection of the Brothers Grimm. It'll be read by Panache Kupla Kawana, a member of our 20s and 30-somethings group. The Fisherman and His Wife. Once upon a time, there was a fisherman who lived with his wife in a run-down, filthy shack. They were very poor, but he did not mind. One day, he went down to the sea to fish. He caught a large flounder. Much to the fisherman's surprise, the fish begged him to let him go. He explained he was in fact a prince who had been enchanted to become a fish. So the man threw the magical creature back into the sea. When the fisherman got home, he told his wife what had happened. Did you ask the fish to grant you a wish? She asked. The fisherman said, no. What would he ask for anyway? The wife told him to go back tomorrow 
And if he caught the fish to wish for a better house. The next day, the husband went fishing, and once again, he caught the enchanted fish. He asked for his wife's wish for a bigger house. The fish replied, your wish has been granted. When the fisherman got home, he found his wife standing in front of a lovely house and a garden for fruit and vegetables. She was delighted, but not for long. After two weeks, she asked her husband to go back to the sea and to ask the fish for a palace. This house is too small. So the fisherman reluctantly trudged back to the shore where he caught the fish and told it what his wife wanted. Go home, she already has it, said the fish. And sure enough, when he got home, his wife was standing in a stone palace with servants waiting on her. But the fisherman's wife was still not satisfied. The next morning, she looked out the window at the rolling hills beyond her estate. I would like to be king of all that land. That is what I need. So the fisherman went back to the sea and sheepishly asked for his wife to be the king. And the wish was granted. But a few weeks later, he was back telling the fish that his wife wanted to be the emperor of all the land. And then a few weeks later, she wanted to be the Pope. But when the fish granted that wish, the fisherman noticed the sea was whipped up with tall, menacing waves. And then one night, she declared that she still wasn't happy. What she wanted now was the power of God. But her husband refused to go back to the sea. His wife flew into a rage, kicking him and screaming at him. So, with a heavy heart, he went back to the sea. This time, the sea was churning. The sky was black. Winds were blowing houses and trees over. The fisherman caught the fish and related his wife's wish to have the power of God. Go home, the fish said. She is sitting in her filthy shack again. And they are sitting there even today. Thank you, Panache. The fisherman's wife is convinced that she will be happy if she can be richer and more powerful. Yet with each wish, she becomes more dissatisfied. She suffers more and so does the world around her as the sea and the sky grows more turbulent. She lacks the wisdom to stop, to realize that she's in a paradoxical situation. So she keeps asking for more, making things worse. Life does not get better when you reject the, exist the existence of a paradox. Instead, paradoxes are like riddles, an opportunity to think beyond the limits of common sense. Instead of choosing one side or another, we're invited to see that opposites can coexist, like wealth and unhappiness. You can be rich and powerful and unhappy all at the same time. Equally, a few people can be very rich, the winners in society, so-called winners, and make a lot of other people unhappy, even if we all agree that wealth was worth pursuing. It's the ability to hold two opposites in your head at the same time, which is the challenge and the opportunity posed by a paradox. Our faith is founded on a paradox. Jesus is both man and God at the same time, two things which we expect to be far apart. Jesus saves the world by, be, by being willing to be destroyed by it. 
It's through Christ's defeat that he wins the victory over sin. And he says paradoxical things. The last shall be first. The first shall be last. To save your life, you need to be willing to lose it. Not surprisingly, many have found these, two, these paradoxes too confusing to bear. Christ being God and man at the same time has confounded people all through history. Back in the early days of Christianity, people leaned over to the God side and they said that Christ must have been all God. And so they believed, and this wasn't orthodox thought, but this is some of the thought which the Gnostics and other, other offshoots of Christianity believed. They believed that Jesus had all the superpowers, all the power of God, and that the person on the cross was somebody else. In our own time, scholars have gone the other way, and they've said, hmm, maybe Jesus was just a man, a rabbi who wanted to inspire an uprising against the Romans. So they've sought to find what is called the historical Jesus, the real guy, before all the myths and the religion got built up around him. And so they've done all sorts of historical research, trying to understand what life was like in first century Palestine, what the guerrilla movements against the Romans were like. And this has been very interesting in many ways. It's given a much richer idea of what life was like in first century Palestine at the time that Jesus lived. But this approach also has many problems. One of them is that Jesus just becomes boring. He's no longer a source of wisdom and divine, and divine power. He's just a rabbi with a good way with words who got himself killed. And notably, no new versions of Christianity have sprung out of this soil of just making Jesus into a regular human being. By rejecting the paradox, the scholars have drained Christianity of its power and they have not found a deeper truth. I prefer the paradoxical Jesus. I find that that Jesus has much to teach me. And the key to paradox is that we're challenged to keep these two opposites in our heads at the same time. And when we can do that, we can see the world with a greater clarity and a greater and more subtlety than before. Forrest Gump, for instance, is not bothered by paradox. He lives with it effortlessly. And maybe we shouldn't be surprised. Jesus, our paradoxical teacher, advises his followers to adopt a very simple approach to life, not much different than what Gump adopts. In the scripture that we heard Carol read today from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us that we shouldn't worry about tomorrow. It will bring its own trouble. You can deal with it when it comes. What matters is today. There's no need to worry. God will provide for you, just as the birds and the flowers are taken care of. And that seems like weird advice, doesn't it? Does it mean that we shouldn't save for our retirements or plan to go to university? No, I, I think that kind of planning is fine and is consistent with what Jesus is saying. But just don't take your idea of the future too seriously. Who of us set aside rice and toilet paper and beans three years ago, knowing that there would be a pandemic that would start last March? Or how many of us sold all of our assets and got out of the stock market just before the crash of 2008? As Forrest says, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. It's like that old, that old uh, saw about God. If you wanna make God laugh, make a plan. If this year has proven anything, it's that we're not very good at predicting the future. No one really knows what tomorrow will bring. So it's much more important to focus on how you live today. Christ suggests that we live without worry and trust that God will take care of us if we adopt a simple loving lifestyle. If you love your work, whether it's engineering or law or accounting, Geek out, be true to that. If what you love is the work, then the money's secondary. And be like Gump, be willing to pay higher taxes, be willing to make donations to other causes that could use the money. If you love the work, keep doing the work, but be ready to share the money. 
And I know many of you do that already. The money was never your true love anyway. God wants us to be happy. So we should follow our passions and make the world a better place along the way. We don't have to fall for the idea that money will make us happy. That's just the recipe for an unhappy paradox, as the fisherman's wife discovered. At the end of that story, the fisherman's wife makes the most grandiose wish possible. She says that she wants the power of God. And that lands her back in that dirty old shack. She's lost everything. No more palaces. She's not the pope or king anymore. She's just back in that shack. It seems like a punishment. But there's another way of reading that ending. Maybe she got exactly what she wanted. She asked for the power of God. And the power of God, as we heard in our scripture reading, is to see the beauty in everything. To understand the beauty of the lilies and the birds where everything is provided for. From God's perspective, that shack by the sea full of fish with the blue sky, it's not so bad. Perhaps she really was filled with the power of God. At the end of the Forrest Gump film, Forrest stands before Jenny's grave, who's died of AIDS. He speaks to her, telling her about his life and the life of the son that they've brought into the world. And he says, some people like Lieutenant Dan, believe that life is about destiny. And others say, like his mother, we just float around like a feather in the wind. Gump says, I think maybe it's both. Forrest has learned to live with paradox and his life is richer for that understanding. That blessing can be ours also. Amen.